Hello, it's Writing Wednesday, and we're right in the middle of Michael Cohen's testimony in front of Congress. And uh, uh, as somebody who watched the Watergate uh, hearings, I'm getting amazing flashbacks. It's, uh, it's incredible to um, watch history being made. And uh, uh, I hope everybody has a chance to take a look at that uh, testimony and uh, notice uh, who's doing what. And there'll be surprises. We're going to get to know our Congress people better. Um, I am really uh, glued to my computer because, uh, as some of you know, I got rid of my cable a long time ago. So I either do stuff on the computer or I am trapped with what is on uh, the uh, what comes over my antenna uh, or uh, public radio. So, uh, but I, I'm going to be glued to it all day and for the next two days, I'm sure, three days. Um, so, welcome to Writing Wednesday, and today um, I have a topic that was written to me by um, uh, a, a question from Barbara, uh, started this, uh, a process of thought about use of prologues. Hey, Linda! Um, yes, of course I'm glued to the uh, Cohen hearings. Uh, I'm just taking a little break here. Um, the uh, um, topic of prologue, epilogue, and I thought framing devices fits in there really nicely. Um, I used um, I used a prologue in uh, the opening of of the Revolution of Marina M. Um, a prologue. Why do people use um, prologues? What books use prologues? Uh, I made a little informal study here uh, for y'all today. Uh, what, you know, books that use prologues. Um, the Name of the Rose has a prologue. Um, the Hours has a prologue. Um, Orphan Train, The Alchemist, Water for Elephants. And these are not necessarily framing devices. Um, what a prologue will do for you um, is that if you have a novel that has a complex sociological or historical um, setting that you don't want your characters to have to explain in the middle of live scenes, um, sometimes you can just use a prologue, set up the problem, set up the mood, set up the, uh, you know, any uh, relevant historical material. You set it up first. You can call it prologue. You can call it chapter one. Um, my, in Marina, it's just a different location set in the future. Um, there are prologues that are authorial. There are prologues that use a minor character to set things up. Shakespeare did that uh, a lot. Um, you would be, he'd begin with a minor character coming forward and telling you where we are and who we are and what's going on, and then the play begins. Um, in Marina M, I've used um, a, the protagonist in the future. Um, Many uh, prologues are a different character or set up as a bit of a newspaper clipping. Whatever it is, it sets up the character, it sets up the situation, it gives you information that you don't, the author does not really want his characters um, having to deal with vast sweeps of history um, or sociological material. Um, Nabokov, Lolita, Pale Fire, both of these books have prologues. Um, one of them is called a foreword. A foreword is usually um, not part of the book, but set up uh, in preface to it, often by someone else, an introduction, a preface, a foreword. Um, but uh, the foreword of Pale Fire, for instance, is 
one of the characters in the book setting up a fake biography of the po of the poet who has written this 999 line poem the terrible poet uh, but the uh, author of the um, foreword is part of the book so it is um, it is just meta upon meta and so funny if you haven't read Pale Fire, read it. So the foreword is not a real foreword. It's a fake foreword, and it's part of the novel. Um, it's just being, you know, uh, Nabokov has invention to spare. He's one of the most clever, inventive writers that there could possibly be. And so his foreword is actually part of the book. It's one character describing another character, and all kinds of things seep through. It's a very spiteful little book and really funny. And then Lolita also has a preface, also called a foreword, in which a, um, a well-meaning uh, psychiatrist is describing the case study of this guy, Humbert Humbert, and the situation which proceeds in the book. So it gives you uh, an, a, kind of an apologia Hi, glad you like the scarf. Yay. Um, I always wear my daughter's uh, things that she's about to, to get rid of. It's like, oh, I'll take that. <laughs> so um, the, the foreword say to Lolita, the preface, the um, prologue, um, Lolita or the confession of a white widowed male were suit. Uh, such were the two titles under which the writer of the present note received it, the strange pages it perambulates. So this is a psychiatrist talking about the manuscript he'd received. And that's a very common setup for a book. Um, how I received this manuscript, uh, I have no idea why, or here's why, or here's how I got it. And then the book continues. So it gives you a lot of historical and sociological information that the writer just doesn't want to have to deal with in the story. That's why the prologue exists. It's, um, uh, it carries some of the expository weight so the character, so the author doesn't have to twist the characters around to talk about things that, or think about things that, uh, they are living and wouldn't be thinking about. Um, you, you know, it's not necessary. Certainly most books do not have them, but uh, Barbara asked, how is it used? Why do we have prologues? You know, when would you use it? And this is, this is the purpose of it. Um, it's, uh, it's Canterbury Tales, the first part of Canterbury Tales, uh, before they actually go on the journey. That's, that's a prologue. Um, beginning of Romeo and Juliet, you have um, um, one of the characters I was digging for my Romeo and Juliet, I couldn't find it. Um, but you you do have a minor character come forward and tell you what is about to happen in the whole setup. So you don't need to figure it out. Um, it's very explicit. Um, the Hours um, sets up who Virginia Woolf is and where she is in 1941. So you understand the suicide, that suicide is going to be a major theme. Uh, in the book. The prologue often tells you what the theme of the book is going to be. Uh, so you you can have, so the reader is going to be watching for that theme uh, to arrive. Um, here's the opening of The Hours uh, by Michael Cunningham, a favorite book, which has a named prologue. He calls it a prologue. So it's just the first chapter, but it'll be different stylistically from the rest of the book. Uh, she hurries from the house wearing a coat too heavy for the weather. It is 1941. Another war has begun. In case you don't know that 1941 has this huge overtone. She's left a note for Leonard and another for Vanessa. She walks purposely towards the river. Okay, this is what this book is. It opens with the suicide of Virginia Woolf. And so it that will resonate through the rest of the book. Um, 
the name of the rose is about the discovery. Uh, there, this prologue is a uh, about the discovery of this. Actually, there's a there's a two part. There's a there's an actual there's a foreword which describes how the author got the manuscript. Um, and then there is, so you get some sense of the, you get some sense of what this manuscript might mean, how it came to him. Uh, then uh, there is a note about, just called note, um, and it explains the liturgical hours, which, you know, the people in the book would know damn well about the liturgical hours, but the average reader uh, in the 20th century, late 20th century, would not necessarily know know them or know the times that they uh, correspond to. And then there's a nice map, yay. And then there's a prologue, a real prologue of the name of the rose. And it starts, it gives you a very different tone from the first a forward or whatever it's called, preface. Um, and it describes who I am, the history, why I came to this, um, uh, to this monastery. And so after I had come to know my master day by day, uh, you know, it's the flunky introducing himself and his master. That's a very Shakespearean way to do a prologue. And uh, Umberto Eco, uh, Mr. Metafiction, is very aware of how that works. Um, so, um, it, Michael Crichton uses a lot of, uh, oh, I think most of his books have a prologue of some kind, always f a fictional, like, in one there's like a non-disclosure that, I think it's Jurassic Park, that everybody had to sign this non-disclosure of the events that were going to follow. Um, it's just a way of conveying the information, the setup, without having to do it within the body of the story. Um, uh, another, like a news clipping. Um, the first chapter of Harry Potter is a prologue. It has, it's told third person and omniscient. It's Harry as a baby. Um, I, I have a feeling that if she separated it out, kids wouldn't read it, would skip, skip ahead and lose, you know, uh, essential setup information. So um, it's, it can set up an atmosphere for the book. It can set up characters, understand who the main characters are, explain complex settings that you don't want to have to do in your piece. It frees the character from having to think and deal with things that everybody knows, things that he wouldn't or she wouldn't be thinking or saying. Um, so it's not a foreword or an introduction, which is usually done by another person. Um, a writer or historian or whatever. And then you have somebody wildly inventive like Nabokov will take that and make that a fictional character and part of the story. He's a twisty little guy. Um, very fun. So prologues, I, um, I uh, did mine uh, as a prologue. I started a prologue. Um, I don't call it a prologue. Um, Marina M. starts in 1932. It's a story of the revolution, but it starts with the kind of the what what you end up with when you have gone through this kind of experience. Um, so it places a kind of a, a point of view outside the book as um, the reader will be outside that information that that story. Most of us haven't lived through the Russian Revolution. So it gives us somebody a place to stand, I think, 
Um, and I really, I needed that. Uh, I wanted that, to have that. Uh, who is this voice speaking to us, you know? Uh, and then the first chapter of the book takes you back uh, to 1916. I think historical fiction um, benefits from having a prologue and setting us up and we know where we are and who we are and kind of the basics of who everybody is so that we don't become hopelessly lost um, in the story. It gives us a, especially a sense of the atmosphere of the work and uh, the, its theme, which will emerge from the book eventually, but often a, um, to say what the concern of the book was uh, to begin with, or imply it, you never just say it, but to give people that extra help, just like starting it off with Virginia Woolf's, the hour starting with Virginia Woolf's suicide. I mean, it, you know that this is going to be about it's a suicide book. It's about that question, to be or not to be, you know? And we start with, yes, people do do this. This is not just a possibility. Um, and it affects our reading of the book. Uh, it sets up the atmosphere of the book. Um, the literary quality of the book, the uh, quiet, what quiet despair looks like, what, you know, the, the lapping of mental illness at the foundation of a human being, what that feels like over time. The prologue sets that up. So let's talk about, uh, so it's not a foreword or an introduction. Uh, although if you want to have a character do that or to use another fictional element, that becomes a whole another level. It's very nice, really a fun way uh, to tell a story. So, hi. So um, then if we're going to talk about uh, a prologue, let's talk about epilogue. Do you have to, if you do a prologue, do you have to do an epilogue? No, you do not. There are books that have epilogue and no prologue, like War and Peace. There is a foreword by historians and translators and stuff. The book begins, you read along, War and Peace. Uh, Napoleon's conquest of Russia, or his attempt to do so. There are two epilogues to that enormous book. I mean, he covers the waterfront, but he's not done. He's Tolstoy. He's got he's got such momentum. He's got such such a deep well of things he wants to say about this that he has two epilogues and they are written by him. It's not a fictional character. It's not part of, the, part of the plot of the book. But he wants to talk about what is history? What is history? He wants to address you now directly and really think about the themes of the book and what he believes about history. Um, and most people skip it. <laughs> it's interesting to read. You can read it as an essay without reading the book. Um, but he felt it was necessary. Usually an epilogue adds a bit of extra information about the life or the fiction, uh, the future of the characters. So if you, anybody saw American Graffiti, uh, the very end, we see how where everybody ended up. That's an epilogue. Um, Often writers were, were horrible, you know, once we are, novelists are marathon runners, you know, we're not spinners. And if you've been running all that time, it's very hard to stop once you're, you know, once you write the end, you know, sometimes you just have that momentum and you have a little bit more. Often you write a epilogue and then decide not to use it. I just did that with the second book, uh, uh, the end of the Revolution of Marina M, uh, Chimes of Lost Cathedral. I actually wrote an epilogue to it and then decided, you know what, I don't need this. Um, because there's also the problem of the two endings. You know, if you really sock an ending, you, you land that blow, it reverberates. You know, you get the big gong for an ending. Boom, when you are feeling it. To come back at that point and write an epilogue 
gives you two endings. It and then any any time there's a repetition, any time you have two of something, they weaken each other. You know, we've talked about that in editing. That you, it's like if you've said things two ways, pick the strongest one, cut the other one. It's just like pruning flowers. If you want a big, you know, chrysanthemum, you cut the side buds so you let that one bud really do its thing in writing cut the stuff that's not quite as strong and leave the strongest thing so if you've ended very strongly and the the big gong starts to move back through the book and move through the reader and then you add an epilogue you're actually taking emotional power from the end of the book so it's only if you feel like you haven't really rung the gong that you might want an epilogue. Um, White Oleander um, did not have that strong ending. It had, um, you knew what happened, but I didn't feel it really having resolved yet. So I moved ahead, had the character thinking about the past. She's building these suitcases. I don't know if you remember. Um, and then having that bit of the future rounded out the book. And then you felt the big gong that moved through the book. Didn't have that before. Uh, Paint It Black, I did not use an epilogue. I felt that, that her resolution uh, with Michael's death was strong enough and uh, the little bit of not picking of picking that girl up for the ride at the end if you've read Painted Black, to me that that was a good resolution. I did not feel uh, the need to say what happened to Josie and you know Meredith and blah 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 blah. Didn't need it. Uh, and in this book, I you know it doesn't hurt to try. You know you can write an epilogue and ask yourself, does this take away from the ending? Is it like the step too far? Or does it really finish it correctly? Um, let's see. So why epilogue? Why would you, why would you use one? Um, if you just don't, if you have story threads that you feel the reader is going to kill you if you don't tell them what happened then that's the that's the time for the epilogue you know and what happened to, to Hector you know after the, the events of the book usually it happens the epilogue is right after the end of the book or it's several years in the future so you know what happened um, in horror especially uh, often there's an epilogue to show that the creature is still out you know, to show that Hannibal Lecter is, is out and on the loose. Um, that that uh, reinforcement of the continuing terror uh, is, a, is a happening thing in horror. And the epilogue is, is often used there. So, um, what is the... Then what is a framing device? What's the difference between epilogue, prologue, epilogue, and the framing device where we start as, um, you know, an essay. I know the main character, Astrid, from White Oleander will have grown and changed. Do you ever think about revisiting the character? You know, I never, never say never, but I'd be more likely to do a prequel and find out why Ingrid is the way she is. Um, but let's talk about the framing device. Um, You are, you know, the old woman on her deathbed is a favorite framing device, going back into her life, um, every once in a while coming back to the deathbed scene, going back under Tinkers uh, as a novel very much like this. And then you begin and end in the frame. In the frame. You know, you pull, you pull back and you're back in the, pr the present, which doesn't have to be a big you know, completely interwoven thing. You open with it and you close with it. Um, I think that a prologue and an epilogue kind of function a little differently. 
than a framing device uh, because of the way it sets up the history and stuff as opposed to just a story within a story. Uh, the prologue isn't the story. It doesn't begin the story. It is before the story. Um, so I would say, um, you know, prologues are, uh, it, the framing device doesn't have to be interwoven uh, as opposed to a braided story where the, the, um, present story is woven throughout, then it's just a braided story. Whereas if, if it just is the frame, you know, let's just think of the frame that you, it gives you a place to enter, a place to know where you are, um, with, you know, obviously featuring, you know, the main character setting it up, you go down into the main story, you come up at the other end of the frame. Uh, and you touch on it maybe from time to time within it. I think there's overlaps to the two ideas, but uh, a prologue works differently. You don't have to have that second part. You don't have to weave it in. Uh, it kind of stands on its own. Um, I'm getting um, suggestions for for uh, <laughs> how to write a, a prequel to What All I Had. Uh, how about any questions about the... Uh, Prologue, use of prologue, use of epilogue, um, use of framing devices. Barbara, I did your your uh, your prologue question here. Um, I, uh, you know, there's when you're writing, there's the needs of your characters, what they you know, they're supposed to do, but then the, there's the need of the author to make, um, to deal with the technical problems of writing the book and also to deal with their attachment to the characters, their attachment to the book. And uh, often it's the writer who has to figure out how do I come into this? How does the reader enter into the book? Uh, is a super important question. Um, and uh, to use the prologue especially sets up that theme of the book and sets up not necessarily a voice because often the voice changes very much between the prologue, usually changes very much between the prologue and the first chapter. Um, or, but it can also just set you up. But who the hell is this? Uh, the Shakespearean one, you know, minor characters talk about what's going on. And, oh, we saw the ghost on the ramparts, you know. Um, it's not really a, it's not really a scene that progresses from there. That's just the setup before the main characters come on. Um, what are some unsuccessful or cliche uses of prologue you've seen in drafts. Um, I think there is a, when it will set up an historical moment without letting the reader have a feel for how this book is going to um, how this book is going to be written. When you read it, it's like to read the um, Nabokov prologues uh, to Pale Fire and to Lolita. Um, you know, you know, you get, you're getting a taste of his playfulness and the tease and the playfulness as well as the setup that he's trying to give you. If you're reading the prologue for um, The Name of the Rose, which is M M Middle Ages, Sherlock Holmes in the Middle Ages, um, he's giving you a sense of diction, of period, um, as well as the information that, that he wants you to have. Um, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This was beginning with God, and the duty of every faithful monk would be to repeat every day with chanting humility, the one never-changing event whose incontrovertible truth can be asserted. So it gives you the mindset. In this time, people didn't argue with stuff. People didn't question stuff. You get it right there. So you're getting sociological information from that prologue, but not necessarily in a bald-faced, you know, essay-ish way. It is part of the book. It is, um, uh, it's got to be skillfully done and not just blurted out like, you know, a high school textbook. Um, isn't the prologue written after the book? It's after the book is written, yes. Yeah. You usually will write your book and just, it'll be sitting with you, and then you'll go back to your first chapter and go, gee, this is not doing what it needs to do for me. I am not, I want it to expand a little bit more. I, I need the reader, to, I need to set the reader up. Um, so it usually responds to what you've done in the book and you write it. Not necessarily after the whole ending, but you might. Um, but it's to set up the room. It's like to get a tone in the air. Um, what else can I... What else can go wrong with a prologue? Well, you certainly want it to be enough like the book that the reader can see it's not an introduction, it's not a forward, it's not that stuff that we don't read. Like, I never, ever, ever read an introduction first. I read the introduction last because I want to deal with the book directly and then I'll go back and um, read the introduction and get all kinds of information that I miss. But I will always read a prologue. Um, but. J.K. Rowling didn't even write that prologue for, uh, didn't even call it a prologue, that first chapter of Harry Potter, because she she probably thought the kids might skip it. Uh, so she just made it a first chapter. But the voice is going to be different. Um, you can tell the, the difference between us setting it up and then, oh, now the story starts. Um, what else can I? Anything? you struggle with it at, you know, should it be a prologue? Should there be a prologue? Um, but take a look at, at books that have them. Uh, the Alchemist, I believe, has a prologue. Um, who else does? The Orphan Train. A lot of historical, ha you know, because they don't want to have to have the characters so ultra aware of the history and sociology of what they're doing. So they'll set up... Um, and Shutter Island, okay, it pro you know, take a look at at horror and see how that is set up as well. What else have we here? And uh, am I going to be at the LA Times Festival of Books this year? Yes, I am. I will be. I don't know what panel I'm going to be on, but I'm going to be on it. And um, with uh, Marina M, that should be very exciting. And... Um, now I think I am going to go back and watch um, the drama unfolding in Congress as Michael Cohen talks about uh, what he's been doing all this time with uh, Mr. Trump. A lot of people who hate prologues, this is a good question I need to answer this one. Um, why do people hate prologues? I think that they, if it's not, compelling if it if it seems to be too much dry information then it might as well be a, an introduction um, people hate prologues because they want to get to the story you know it's the reason I skip forwards and introductions except for Nabokov because I can read it and tell oh this is in character this is part of the book so people hate bad prologues so if you're going to write a prologue make it part of the book, you know, make a, make it a character, make it, a, you know, have, make it carry the atmosphere of the book so people have an, you know, can see even from the prologue that there's an expectation there and you wouldn't, you wouldn't miss that. Um, so, um, 
is it the word? I didn't call my prologue in Marina M a prologue. I think people might dislike the word and not understand the difference between a, an introduction, a foreword, um, a prelude, and a uh, prologue. So, uh, you know, you don't even have to chapter it. I didn't chapter it. That's how I handled it. Uh, the first, op the opening of Marina M just has a place and a date. Um, and then we go to part, then when there are the maps in the part one and uh, the maps first. But then there's a break and it says part one and then chapter one. So I just get away from calling it a prologue and then it's less likely to be uh, skipped. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, let's see if uh, what what emerges in the drama happening in Washington, D.C. right now. Uh, can't wait. All right. Thank you very much. Bye.